Yes. Okay. Uh, brilliant. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm Michaela. I'm a growth strategist at Codific, uh, where I work in sales, SEO efforts, and marketing efforts. Um, over the past couple of years, I've been doing interviews with um, healthcare professionals all over Europe about Video Lab and its use cases. Um, so, I've actually seen uh, your name pop up many different times. So, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. And for the audience, um, we're here with Haskawan Middendal. I'm really sorry if I completely butchered your name. Um, that was uh, pretty close, yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, yes, so if you could please go ahead and introduce yourself um, for the audience. Yes, of course. Uh, well, my name is Haske van Veenendal, and, and to pronounce it in Dutch, and um, I'm a health scientist. Um, I studied health sciences at the University of Maastricht and I specialized in um, healthcare quality and within healthcare quality I, I further specialized in patient perspective and shared decision making and I've been working within patient organizations, within hospitals, within um, or you call it academic institutions that focus on healthcare improvement. And mm -hmm. the last seven years, I've also done a PhD project, or finished a PhD project on shared decision making in oncology care. Brilliant. And also, um, I saw that you were also an owner of a business that um, provides shared decision making um, training. Sorry, my voice is cracking because I'm a little bit ill. Um, sorry. I don't want to say the name <clears throat> because I think I'm going to pronounce it terribly. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I have my own business and that's called Trant um, for the care of tomorrow. So uh, it's about how to improve healthcare. Um, but I've already um, set up another organization, a network uh, business in which we uh, gather as trainers for shared decision making. It's called the School for Shared Decision Making. In in English, then <laughs> in Dutch, it's different. Um, and uh, we're we're giving a lot of presentations, uh, do a lot of trainings, and we also work with um, um, how do you call it? Collecting consultations via the Codific system um so we have different training forms and um yeah we work a lot with healthcare professionals in the netherlands brilliant and just to kind of take a step back how did you get involved with uh shared decision making yeah that that's already about 16 years ago and in that time uh we were thinking a lot about how to better involve patients in healthcare quality improvement and so for example in guideline development or, or um, audits that were performed in hospitals um, and at that time we also started thinking about how this could work within um, the consultation rooms of healthcare professionals how this would work together with patients and um, there were some studies um, with so-called uh, decision aids um, mm -hmm. and decision aids are sort of uh, booklets for or uh, nowadays they're of, of course they're mostly their websites but at that time it were booklets or uh, even videos for patients and mm -hmm. they were supposed to help patients to think about difficult decisions in healthcare and uh, research showed that they were very effective in, in comparison to say the traditional ways of communication in, in uh, consultation rooms so if we gave these decision aids to patients they were better informed they had less regrets they were less uncertain about the, the choices they had to make with their healthcare professional but there were a lot of positive effects at that time um, so I, in the Netherlands, I, I, I get, got a, a, a project. I became project leader of a national project to develop these decision aids. 
So we did this for about five years and we developed about 20 of those effective decision aids. And then we put them on a website that was about 2010. Mm -hmm. and, um, the next thing, of course, we did was we looked at how much these decision aids were used by patients. And uh, <laughs> that was terrible. So the whole implementation of these decision aids was a, a, a major challenge. And, and of course, this we looked into the literature and studies and, and they came up with the same, same uh, results. So we knew at that time that we had a new um, target or ambition. We should aim at the implementation of shared decision making. So in 2000, um, 13, 14, I started thinking about ways to improve the implementation in daily healthcare. But it, it started with those decision aids uh, already mm -hmm. back in, in 2006. Yeah. Brilliant. Because I was um, just going to go on, and, and it's a very basic question, I'm sure, as well, um, is ask, you know, why is um, shared decision making important in medicine? What benefits does it give? On both sides and and what do you mean with both sides sorry i mean for the um patient and then um either for the clinician the doctor or the student etc yeah well for the patient it's it's there are several uh possible games um for example they they have less regret about the decisions that are being made um, they're, they're less uncertain, they're better informed, the compliance with therapies is higher, the relationship with, with clinicians improves. Um, so, yeah, there, it's, I always say, just pick the thing that you like, <laughs> because the, the, the uh, results, the, the effects are, are major. Um, and this is this is being shown within uh, a systematic review about every four or five years, <clears throat> and there are over a, over a two hundred randomized controlled trials by this time. So it's yeah, it's, it's there's a lot of proof that this works. Um, mm -hmm. For clinicians, there's n the the research that has been uh, carried out is is not so extensive um, but what we see is that um, professionals experience that uh, if they perform shared decision making that the consultations or the, the um, discussions they have with the patients are more structured because mm -hmm. it has a, several models that you can use within your discussion um, with the patient or the interaction with your patients um, they also like that patients are more involved so they they become more active in the conversation that they have together um, and also some some uh, clinicians say that it's nice to not have the responsibility of the outcome of the uh, treatments for for example by him or herself so it's it's a mm. shared, it's more a shared responsibility for what happens with with the patient yeah of course um so i'm going to ask a um a, a couple of questions that are on different levels of expertise so a wide audience um can get value out of this conversation so just kind of going back um how would you explain shared decision making if you had to explain it to a six-year-old for example <laughs> to a six-year-old <laughs> okay mm -hmm. uh well i'll try to to explain it to my children <laughs> <laughs> when they were young so uh, how do you explain it to them <laughs> yeah well it, the first thing is that there is something to choose so the, it's not that one thing is the best to do but there's a choice to make and it's not the one choice is not better than the other all choices are okay so that's the first thing and when we are making this choice together uh it's important that we know what are the pros and cons of each of the possible choices that we can make and it's important that we know 
what you find important as my child or as my patient or uh, mm -hmm. whoever you're deciding with. So, and if we put those things together, the perspective of what's actually the, what are ex ex exactly the pros and cons and what is the perspective of the one who is sick or has to make this choice with the a clinician, then we always come to a choice that fits with this specific person. Mm. And how would you explain it to, for example, a, a bachelor student um, in the medical field? Um, well, also that there's that this is a situation in which you have the um, opportunity to make a choice with an, with your patient. And in this choice, there are several options. They have pros and cons. So you have to explain or discuss the pros and cons of each of the options that are available. And then you have to find out what the patient find it, finds important uh, in relation to the pros and cons of these options so that you can make um, a well-informed decision together, which is also based on the preferences of your patient. Brilliant. And what are the current topics uh, researched or, or debated um, amongst the experts at the moment within the field? Uh, there are a lot of topics in, in, in research. Um, there has been a lot of work uh, in the past years about um, models. So models to apply when you're actually in interaction with your patient. So you can say there's a definition of shared decision making, but what does it mean when I'm sitting together with my patient? What do I do? Mm. So we have developed uh, models and, and there's internationally, there's there's consensus about the the model. I think there's always a <laughs> debate going on, but more or less we have consensus about what are the most important steps and the content of a good shared decision-making conversation. So that's one thing. The other thing is health literacy, of course. So we're able to do this with um, smart patients that work nicely together with us. But how about the patients that are, have um, a lot of yeah, trouble um, to understand information or even to read, um, like analphabetics? Uh, another research area is implementation so what i'm doing right now so we know that shared decision making is effective but how can we apply it on in, in the right way in each context for each uh, disease for each clinician and each patient um yeah i think that that are some of the topics that are also mm -hmm. measurements so how do we how do we measure in the right way uh, and, and what types of outcomes do we need to measure so that's more the methodology of, of measurement of shared decision yeah. of course that actually rolls off very well for my next question which is um is the uh, structure like or as you've mentioned is the the models is it always the same um when you're working with a patient do you always go through the same set of kind of uh, checklists to make sure that you're having a, a shared um, consultation, shared decision-making consultation. Yeah, the, I think the steps are very general. So mm -hmm. and sometimes <clears throat> you need to add things, like um, if you have a patient that um, is in chronic care or, or long-term care, then uh, very, often you have several diseases within one patient like comorbidity mm -hmm. um, and of course then you have to decide first or discover first what dis discussion or what type of decision you are to going to discuss with the patient so there's a preparation step but um, apart from that uh, it's it's very general so it's it, it's mm -hmm. four steps it's it's first you, you introduce that there's a decision to make and and what is the role of your, yourself as the clinician and what is the role of the patient in the decision making and then you have the pros and cons of the of the options 
um, and you check whether the patient really understands what you have discussed together. And then the third step is about what is important to the patient, what matters to the patient, um, what are the patient preferences and values and context. Uh, and the fourth step is is uh, bounding this together into a decision uh, that is good for the patient and also um, uh, supported by the clinician. Okay. So those four steps are yeah very general. Some some models say well you have an, an, another step step five in which you evaluate whether the the choices you have made are are. Um, uh, giving the results that you wanted so and then you start up again with sometimes with making new choices or um yeah adapting the choices you you made before yeah. mm. and are there any specific frameworks i guess um this would very much apply to to your business with um with actually training um shared decision making are there any specific frameworks to learn how to properly do this? Obviously, you've got a set um, a set of questions and a set of um, of guides to obviously take depending on the patient. Um, but do you have any frameworks when um, teaching how to um, how to you know have a shared decision making uh, conversation? Well, basically, this is the framework that I just told you, but. Mm -hmm when we train it it's it's all about the the specific context in which the the clinician works and that is very different so a cancer patient is very different um, different from a child or uh, a chronic patient is very different from an acute patient um, and then you have the role of, of uh, families uh, loved ones uh, you have high high educated people you have low so it's very different every time for each clinician you can work as a clinician within a, a big city you can work in you know the the, the how do you call it the local uh, mm -hmm. farmer's land <laughs> i don't know mm -hmm. how to pronounce this say this in english um rural area i guess yeah. um so so it's it's very different each time and that that is that is why it's so important to to train and um what happens often is that clinicians have to internate the 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 four steps that i just uh, discussed into their own context and situation and what for them will be uh the moments that they want to apply the shared, shared decision making techniques um and that is something um that takes time and discussion and uh, examples and training uh, mm -hmm. because it's about behavior right so you you have to change as a clinician you have to change the way you communicate and this is about how how you think about your role as a, as a clinician towards the patient. Um, is the patient able to to decide about difficult stuff like like healthcare uh, uh, decisions? Um, how do I think about autonomy of the of my patients? Uh, about my own role. Uh, so yeah, that, that this is what what the training is really about. Okay, brilliant. And what has happened in the last few years in the field? Has there be, been any significant developments? Um, if you could sum it up. Uh, well, we're, we're still developing decision aids. So <laughs> it goes on and on and on. And there's uh, always studies about uh, randomized control trials, about uh, decision aids for uh even more and more decision situations and um they keep on showing that their the, the decision aids are effective but what you see now is that there's more research into training uh, mm -hmm. learning and there's more uh, research into um, the effects of shared decision making on uh, the organization of healthcare like 
finances, uh, guidelines, um, um, uh, clinical pathways. So how, how do we work together as a team? How does it work within a busy hospital if we want to do this? And for example, we have to make a um, split into the, um, uh, the four steps that I just uh, discussed. Huh? So mm. sometimes patients need to reflect and have time to think about decisions. But if we have a, a clinical pathway that that doesn't give room for patients to think for a couple of days about the decision to make, then it's difficult to change it as a as a healthcare team or, or organization. So mm. it's more research into that. There's more research into uh, low low health literacy. Um, so how can we better inform patients that I have trouble to to take this information um, in an easy way? Mm. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant. That's that's, that's uh, perfect. Thank you. Of course, um, that's more, but um, and what yeah. you see also very interesting is is is. For example, in the United States, in, in, in England, uh, the Netherlands, uh, uh, Scandinavian countries, shared decision making is pretty popular, so to say. Mm -hmm. But you see also new countries starting with shared decision making uh, on all different areas of the, of the world. So that's also mm -hmm. very interesting. Which which regions would you say uh, lead the way with shared decision making training and implementation within um, medical within medical schools or hospitals, etc.? Yeah, I, I would say, of course, the United States because okay. it's a big big country. Also, mm -hmm. Canada. The United States also always a bit a bit um, uh, what do you call it? scattered, like. You have one area there they're doing mm -hmm. a lot and other areas they they don't know so they don't work at this uh, on this topic uh, canada is 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 uh, very active the scandinavian countries germany the netherlands um i think um those are the, the most uh, but we also see taiwan uh, yeah. australia new zealand um, Brazil. Yeah, it? brilliant. So, of course, Belgium, but uh, um, yeah. It's slowly yeah. definitely becoming a, a bigger force um, within within medical training, it seems. Yeah, and there's uh, the International Shared Decision Making Society, ESDN, okay. uh, mm -hmm. that, that um, organizes a congress each in each, uh, two years. So that will be next summer in in Switzerland, um, and if you want to, yeah, to get acquainted with this topic, then this is a very good moment to a place to go and uh, and find out what is happening in the in the scientific world of shared decision making, but also in in practice. Mm. So what's what's happening with training and implementation? Brilliant, and. <clears throat> Excuse me. You mentioned in actually in one of your papers about um, accelerating implementation of shared decision making in the Netherlands. Um, that uh, I believe one of um, the strategies that you concluded was was to increase shared decision making um, in a way to stimulate the empowerment of uh, patients. How can you teach your students uh, the balance between? obviously their professional opinion, um, but also in empowering the patients to choose for themselves. Well, the patients don't choose for themselves. Shared decision making is choosing mm -hmm. together. So um, that's that's one of the um, uh, misconceptions that, that people can have, right? That you that you put the, the, the decision on the shoulders of the patient, but mm -hmm. um, it's it's really about sharing the decision. So, it's about uh, what role do I have as a clinician, and what role can the patient play? And a lot of clinicians would say, well, a patient is not able to decide in the way that that I am 
uh, able to do it because I, I have had my education and I'm an expert. I've seen many, many patients. Uh, we have our guidelines. We have a lot of knowledge about this disease and the choices to make. Um, but that's all. That's all about the medical side of the of the of the choice that you have to make, right? So, the thing is that that you try to um, make people aware of that there's more than only the medical side of making choices and the medical information. There's also the side of of preferences and the life of the patient in which this has to come to effect, right? Yeah, you make a decision and it, it, it's the patient lives with this decision for the rest of his life or her life. So, and that's also very important. And if somebody um, has specific values, uh, if somebody likes to sport, for, for example, and uh, you sometimes you come to different decisions than somebody who likes to play cards with friends in 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 um, in a cafe, right? Or mm. so. Um, and that's very important because they will play cards for the rest of their lives. So if they like to like to play cards for the rest of, the, of their lives, or they like to sport for the rest of their lives, or they like to cook, or they like to take care for the for the grandchildren or whatever, right? So the choice has to fit in this life, and this is what you don't know as a clinician. And the only thing what you can do is yeah. to invite patients and to empower the patient to give this information to you as a clinician to discuss this and to see what choice or what pros and cons fits best with this patient knowledge or patient situation or a patient perspective or how, how whatever you want to to call it so mm -hmm. yeah I, I think shared decision making is is a very active process of the clinician but also about getting the patient being active and tell and share what what is important or what matters to to him or her yeah definitely of course i i know that you did a lot of um research as well with with cancer patients and in, in oncology care um yep. and i know this very much applies to that because it's obviously um that's on a much harsher scale um because it's obviously it can it can be terminal um unfortunately the diagnosis and i can imagine that it very much applies um shared decision making within um especially within those patients yeah okay. <clears throat> um so sorry are you okay <laughs> yeah, i have to change my 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 okay that's fine um, so I know that you just recently uh, published your PhD. I actually I haven't had the pleasure of reading it yet. So would you mind? I know that it's a PhD, so it's a it's a bit difficult to give a proper um, summary of it. Um, yeah. But would you mind explaining a little bit about um, you know what it was about, um, etc. Yeah, it, it, the the dissertation was about. Um, implementation of shared decision making in, uh, in in daily healthcare in clinical oncology care mm -hmm. um, so we I started with saying that shared decision making is an effective strategy communication strategy for me that's not so interesting anymore to do research at but mm -hmm. I think that it is even more interesting to to look at how we can apply this every day in daily care and what what is needed to to support that or to facilitate or um, accelerate that uh, so what we did is we um, we did a study with um, front runners so people who are already doing this at a higher level a relatively mm -hmm. high level and we gathered them and and had interviews with these people about what can we do to accelerate this implementation. And they gave uh, several uh, advices, uh, recommendations about what to do uh, on the national level for the Netherlands. Um, and that, that is about empowering the patients, that's about getting setting good examples in this area, uh, it's about um, doing implementation work 
and, and studies and to set up uh, effective training strategies, etc. Um, so that was one of the, the parts of the, um, the research. And then um, we took these recommendations to start up um, two large implementation studies. In, in total, uh, 11 teams of hospitals in breast cancer care. And we co-created with these teams and together with patient organizations, we co-created an implementation strategy, an uh, implementation plan um, that involves uh, shared decision-making tools, training, um, looking at the organization, looking at uh, the context in which they have to work, um, like guidelines and um, <coughs> uh, finances and stuff like that. So uh, um, what we call a multi-level implementation plan. Uh, mm -hmm. And we worked with these teams for about a year in, in two projects that we, in between we did an evaluation um, of the implementation strategy or implementation plan so that we could improve our implementation approach in between. Um, so we had another three studies, um, one of six hospitals, then the evaluation, and then another five hospitals. And we mm -hmm. showed that this uh, multi-level implementation strategy is, is very effective uh, on the level of application of shared decision making within consultations. So that was our major um, outcome measure. Mm. And the next thing that we did was an, um, uh, an interview, uh, or sorry, a questionnaire study among uh, cancer patients, what their experiences are with uh, shared decision making and what they need, uh, what they miss in mm. their uh, discussions with their healthcare clinicians. So, for example, we or they they told us that they uh, more than eighty percent of the cancer patients wants to discuss want also to discuss the option of no treatment. Okay, wow. Mm. Well, we're a, a bit surprised because we we knew that patients find this important to discuss also about not treating their disease, but that it that it would be that high as as more than eighty percent um yeah that was quite surprising so and we took this again back to the clinicians of course and and uh, talked with them about what to do with this <laughs> finding mm. uh, and that's very interesting we had a, a, an, another study we did about um uh, a major barrier for shared decision making and that's that is that clinicians think that shared decision making takes more time uh, so if you do more shared decision making uh, people are afraid that it will take more time consultation mm. so we did a systematic review and, and meta-analysis and we showed that it looks like that it doesn't have to take more time uh, so there were 35 studies that we selected and 28 of those studies do not show an increased level of uh, consultation duration um, okay. so yeah and the only question that remains is whether there's a, a temporary uh, increase of consultation time so that after before, for example you you do a training or you use a, a decision aid within your consultation or in your clinical pathway that it temporarily increases the consultation duration and after a while when you're used to working with this new uh, um, uh, new new habits System, or, yeah. or the new decision tools that is you know that that, that it um, doesn't take a, a, a more time anymore so um, but we don't know that there's two mm. two letters that's done at this at that uh, question and yeah. the last part of my uh, uh, dissertation is about a, is a study protocol in which we uh, study the um, effect of uh, uh, individual feedback and coaching on 
uh, audio recorded consultations. Um, so we find out in the other projects that we did that feedback on giving feedback on recorded uh, consultations is effective, but we mm -hmm. want to see whether we can scale it up on a national level. So we included 14 hospitals in our study. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we digit, digitalized the whole approach um, so that we could, yeah, we think we could scale it up uh, more easily. So, but that's only protocol. So this study is not uh, finished yet. Okay, brilliant. Well, um, I was actually just going to ask you, you know, we, we know you um, because you use Videolab. Um, would you be able to, Tell us a bit more about um, about how you've used it, uh, what training do you use it for, and uh, why did you pick Videolab to start with? Yeah, we were looking for a system to, to uh, safely record consultations. Um, when I started with my PhD, um, there was a, a good instrument to um look at at uh, consultations to so to observe what happens within the consultation room uh, as it comes to the level of shared decision making that uh, clinicians apply mm -hmm. uh, but the thing was it was only used for research purposes so a lot of consultations were recorded by video or audio or observed by 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 an observer within the room um, and um, they were also scored on, on you can give a score on a level of one of zero to hundred and zero is no shared decision making hundred is the best shared decision making you can accomplish um, but it was only used for research purposes and what we did is um, when we talk to patients and, and clinicians um, they said we want to know what comes out of this observation right so we want to have this feedback to see whether we can improve so we mm -hmm. started to develop um, uh, feedback forms uh, for um, clinicians and then we also needed of course a, a simple system um, to to safely record these consultations uh, and we're working with 11 hospitals at the beginning of our projects and, and, and in this study we're doing now another 14 hospitals so it needs to be safe it needs to work at every place and we need to uh, be able to approach it from you know the place where i work like within this room or wherever i'm yeah. working uh, um, so then we uh, looked at different systems that um, that would support this recording and uh, well via, via our network we uh, get in co got in contact contact with uh, with codefic and video lab so um, we tried it and we were very uh, positive about it so we yeah, Brilliant. started using well, it. yeah i'm i'm very glad you find you find value in it that's the the whole point of the system is to be as valuable as possible for exactly um your use case yep. where do you where do you think um video lab could be used in the future if you've ever um reflected on it after now having experience with the system knowing how it works very well well for for shared decision making in the netherlands we we are trying to to um yeah to to see this giving feedback on consultations as a as a a very uh, normal, uh, regular training approach for clinicians. So I believe that you need to train your communication um, uh, techniques like regularly, say every two years you need to do a training or uh, record mm -hmm. a, a series of consultations and get feedback and, and coaching of, a, of an expert um so um i think for scaling up this this whole idea of training your communication uh competencies it, it's very important to have such a 
yeah so it's a system that facilitates this um, yeah and and i think that that what would help is that we're we're also starting about to think about how how we can also provide the patients to listen to this con this consultation that has been recorded for example and maybe okay. every, every consultation and then have it in the uh how do you call it the, the, the electronic uh, uh record of of patients when they yeah talk. yeah they're able to go back and and they can listen to back, back right? so, being told. yeah yeah and, and they can listen back with the family for example and, and if they have okay, questions brilliant. discuss it within the family and then mm. again they'll go back to the hospital and for for questions and yeah okay wow that's very very interesting um so i actually only have one last question um which is a little bit of a kind of concluding question um and it's how do you see the future of healthcare and what are some of the most important things um that you would have changed um in the next decade yeah well and for me of course it's about shared, sharing decisions but i think shared decision making is a is a way uh, a strategy to change healthcare in the right direction um i think two things are very important in in the healthcare of the future one is equality um mm -hmm. and that means that within healthcare as a clinician and patients we are all humans right so we are equal as as human beings we all have our own qualities and expertise and we need both expertises to come together to to make the right decisions for the lives the daily lives of of the patients that we help as clinicians so we need to really feel that we that 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 equality is is uh a, prerequisite so um something that that should be the standard for us so that's one thing and the other thing is um of course we are equal but we're all different so in order to do this in the right way we need to acknowledge that every patient and every situation is different and also clinicians are different because they're also human beings so the um, the art uh, or the challenge is to um, have the power to to do the right thing in each situation and that is what we call equity so in each specific situation you need to do something different and this is i think this is about learning how to do this and and keep on learning uh, in in very difficult situations very difficult decisions sometimes that that uh, clinicians make with their patients it's the most important thing to yeah to train and to keep on learning on yes definitely well thank you so much um first of all um those are all the questions that i have um, of course, you can have the floor if there's anything that you would like to bring up uh, that we haven't spoken about. Uh, please feel free to. I know that I've asked you loads of questions. No, 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 no. Thank you for the questions and the discussions we had together. And um, if there are any questions of other people uh, coming towards you, or you can mm -hmm. also approach me, of course. Uh, um, I'll be Thank happy you to, so much. to answer. Well, thank you so much, and um, I definitely I look forward to um, actually reading uh, your your PhD. I would definitely think it sounds extremely interesting, um, especially when you you know you have used Video Lab, you know um, the use cases, um, and in general, just with shared decision making implementation um, methods, etc. So um, yeah, thank you so much for your time, um, and have a lovely evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Aske. See you later. Thank you. See you later. Bye.